and my encouragement to some parent who might be in the place I was at that time, I'll give you the same advice that the counselor gave me, which is teach the principles, teach the values that are important, but then give them their domain and, and trust that the process, you train the child in the way that he or she should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. It doesn't mean that in the moment they're catching the training. It doesn't mean in that very moment, you're going to see every fruit of what you're being, tra what you're training into them. But in due time, you'll see that. And Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Between the Lanes. And uh, man, we're so glad you're with us. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being a part of it with us. And uh, Dad, uh, great to see you looking good in your blue. Well, thank you. We coordinated a little bit. I don't know if we really did, but <laughs> <laughs> you're looking good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, listen, we, we, I, I hope you've seen, especially if you're, I know some of you, you're, you're listening, you're not watching it. Uh, but if you're watching, we keep changing our venues around, trying to find a uh, new spot. So hopefully that's keeping you uh, engaged uh, by variety. <laughs> so that's what we'd like to, variety is the spice of life. So we have a little variety between the lanes and uh, hope you're doing great. Hope uh, as we head into sort of the, the fall season and all that's ahead for you, that uh, you've got a great perspective about what God's doing in your life, uh, in your leadership and, uh, and all that's ahead for you. So thanks for being with us today. And, uh, and we're glad to dive into a topic that, um, I think we can probably speak to uh, with with a bit of maybe expertise because <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about how you develop as a leader within the context of family. And now, listen, I want I want you to know you might have grown up. I know when we're talking to, to folks, you might have grown up in a, in a wonderful home. You might not have grown up in a wonderful home. And so the context of family and leadership development might ring hollow with you a little bit or it might ring really true. But here's what I, I want to say to you. As you evaluate your life today and where you are right now, you have the opportunity to turn things around. If you've been at a place where you're like, that's not leadership development within the context of family doesn't mean anything to me. Well, you can begin today. You can start. And that's part of the encouragement is to go, hey, let's give you a vision for the future of how leadership development works. And you might think as you're developing that, man, the way I do that is, is in my workplace or I go to t training or whatever, but we want to give you a perspective of how that happens within the context of family. And as you maybe are beginning your family or you have a family and you haven't really thought about this through the context of family, we want to talk to you about that. So dad, there's, there's the intro. What, what's some more intro thoughts you have? Well, I think the significance of uh, family in the expression of leadership is you learn concepts in in your family. Mm. And if you didn't learn those concepts because your family was fractured or uh, broken in some way, then you, you have developed leadership ideas and thoughts outside of that context. Mm. And I think what God intends in all of it is that w we learn and impart leadership principles to our children that as they grow up, then they become the leaders that God intended for them to be. And so if your mom or dad didn't impart these leadership concepts, there's a, there's a hole that has to be made up someplace else. Yeah. And I agree with you. Uh, when I talk about this in a group setting, I say, look, if, if none of this but you can relate to, what you can do is draw a line today and say, I didn't get that, but I'm going to give that. Yeah. So if you're married, if you have kids, you can impart this, and the key is going to be related to things we talk about today. Yeah, sometimes you need you need a little bit of vision cast for what can be, and you know I think it's it's amazing having gone through life and walked through life with a lot of people. Sometimes people have a lot of vision for their companies, they don't have a lot of vision for their family, or they have a lot of vision for the kind of leader they want to be in their company, but that doesn't necessarily translate to the kind of leader they they can be or want to be at home. And, uh, and so, yeah, so people who are today looking and going, man, I, I'm not sure exactly how to apply developing your, here's, here's what I think about it. You are developing, but you're also developing others. I like, for whatever reason, a, a, a thought has come to my mind that there's somebody out there today, uh, a single man, single woman, young adult, you're, you're living your life. You're like, I don't, I'm, I'm not in the context of my family today, uh, or 
you know, I, I don't have anybody who's, I'm not, I'm not a parent yet. And so how, how does this apply to me? Well, I, I think about all the different ways. Let me just put it in another context. We're going to keep it in the context of family, but I want to take it to a different sort of terminology just to simply go things that are not in your workspace. So how do we develop not in the workplace, but in, in sort of the non-workplace area, people that we influence and, and can't, you might be an aunt or an uncle, you, you have friends who also have kids or you're in the context of family and development and how you develop as a leader uh, happens at, at various, the various lanes that we run in in life. And we want to highlight to you how you develop yourself and how you develop others in that sort of context. Yeah, I had a friend and he, he said, growing up, he would ask his dad, hey, daddy, what do you think about this? Uh, how, how should I do this? And his dad's regular response was, I don't know. Well, he's, he, what parenting is intended to be is, is a training ground that hap, takes the, the circumstances of life and applies principles, principles of leadership, so that you, you learn. Here's how you deal with it. Yeah. And uh, even failings, when you, when you fail, here's how you correct what has taken place. And so if, if your dad, mom was absent in your life or they were disengaged, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm not going to tell you about what I learned in life. I want you to learn it on your own yeah. uh, versus saying, I'm going to, I'm going to develop you. I'm going to take a circumstance that you're dealing with. And I'm going to talk to you about how you lean through this and you, you begin to gain instincts that you carry into other leadership responsibilities. Okay, so before we dive into that, I wanna want give one other sort of uh, ul ulterior perspective about this. Because I can think of a lot of, uh, I say a lot, maybe I can think of two or three off the top of my head, but we could dive in and you, you could probably think of many that come to mind of people who, because they didn't have a good family environment and they were forced to figure things out, that actually drove them to uh, ambition, uh, and and maybe success because of their personality that with with the absence of teaching and training in the home that it forced them to actually go deeper so comment on that for a second because it's a little bit different than what we're going to spend time in but but comment on how that dynamic the sort of the absence of what we're about to talk about has also driven success yeah and uh i think the what what your question makes me think is the idea that uh we're not take, talking about taking responsibility and the learning process out of what what you influence your kids in. Um, there has to be learning. You can't do it all for them. Uh, otherwise, you leave them ill-prepared. Mm -hmm. you, you walk with them through the circumstances that they're dealing with. I think of a young lady that we encountered, and uh, she was a nurse and hated it, mm. hated nursing. And I said, well, why did you major in nursing? She said, my dad made me. Oh. And he made me because he said, as a, as a woman, uh, you, even when you get married, you, there's no guarantee that you'll remain married and you need to have a career that you can fall back to. Mm. And she said, I never wanted to do that. Mm. Well, okay, take the responsibility that a father has to help identify gifts and interests and abilities and to nurture that process, that's a good kind of influence. Mm -hmm. But you take it to an extreme when you say, and I'm gonna decide what you're gonna do and when you're gonna do it and how you're gonna do it. Yeah. I'm gonna make you do it because I think this is right for you. Yeah, yeah. You're, there's a spectrum of complete absence, which it does at times draw, drive people to figure it out and that there's some success. And, but that's complete absence of training or, or parenting. Then the other side is sort of the helicopter parents who are doing everything for them. Um, and, you know, that, that can yield uh, someone very, very codependent yep. and unable to operate in their own independence in, in their development or what kind of company they run or what they do. So, okay, so dive, dive in, give, give sort of a first example of how family brings some context for leadership development. So I think when you talk about family, one of the first things that you learn in family is commitment. Hmm. Yeah. Part of what marriage was intended to be is a commitment between a husband and a wife for a lifetime. Hmm. 
And um, part of the, the fracturing of our family today is the fracturing of that commitment. It's like, mm-hmm. if my needs aren't being met, I'm out. Yeah. I didn't sign up for this, I'm out. Yeah. And, and so when you, when you learn commitment is relative, it, then it impacts your leadership in that as well. Mm-hmm. Because part of uh, success in leading is a commitment. Yeah, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm gonna do it. I'll I'll keep working at it until I resolve it. Till I make it work for everybody in, yeah. involved. Yeah, yeah. And and I think the thing that you learn um, in in sort of that topic of commitment is commitment doesn't always necessarily lead to success. I may be committed to something, and ultimately it didn't it didn't work out. Uh, I may be, I may put my passion and commitment towards something and the, the failure of that actually caused me to grow. Mm-hmm. It caused me to learn something. So the failure is actually a, a learning opportunity, not a loss. Yeah. Um, but, but if I, if, if I go through that in the safety or confines of family, that commitment that I put to something maybe didn't yield what I thought. So I worked through disappointment. I worked through what it looks like to, to have loss. And that, that when that happens, it doesn't tank my perspective on life. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, make me, you know, it may make me question myself, may, may bruise my right. self-confidence, but within the context of family, I'm able to be lifted up, uh, and, and, and I, and I am able to sort of jump on something new, put my commitment to something new at that point. Yeah. And take, for instance, we know statistically, uh, and five out of, 10 marriages today are going to end in divorce. And w- what, if I interpret that, uh, people who come into marriage with a, a an expectation, a joy, a, an excitement for what can be developed, they, at some point in the relationship, they go, eh, this isn't what I signed up for. You're not meeting my needs, you know, and they approach marriage in sort of this contractual form of it's 50-50. Yeah. You give me what I need, I give you what you need, and uh, we we make it work. Yeah. Uh, so uh, those those five, it fall falls away. And there's hurt and things that are associated with that. That leaves five left. And this isn't scientific, but it's been my experience that somewhere around three out of the, the five remaining, they they stay for whatever reason. It's not a fin- good financial decision. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to stay for the kids or whatever it is. But they don't work to build a kind of healthy, satisfying uh, marriage that reflects a commitment. Mm-hmm. They build coping mechanisms. Mm-hmm. So they pour themselves into their work or into their hobbies or into the community. They they build coping mechanisms, sometimes unhealthy. Yeah. They, they can help drugs, alcohol, they build addictions mm. uh, to, to make up for the dissatisfaction they have. That leaves two. Mm. That two marriages that say, I'm, I'm in this for the rest of my life, and I'm not in this to be happy, uh, mm. unhappy. Mm. And so uh, if I'm unhappy or if you're unhappy, I'm going to continue to work until, I'm, until you're happy or yeah. until we address the issues. I'm going to increase my investment. Exactly. It's funny when you, as I as I listen to you talk, you're thinking about family and this issue of commitment through marriage, and I'm looking at it from the standpoint of a child who is learning to do something hard or challenging and learning what commitment looks like. So we're actually coming from it from, uh, you know, you're thinking about it was led you through the marriage commitment, which is modeling for the for the family, and I'm looking at it from what a child is learning in in the area of I'm committed to something. And the development of, of that behavior and that, that characteristic is going to be super important later in life. And if I learn it well in the context of family where I can succeed and fail all the while learning that commitment is super important, but it's also super challenging, uh, that's now setting me up for what is going to be the reality in life. Yeah. And think about that when it, it, when it comes to your business, your commitment, your employees or your employer. In, in my dad's generation, it was common for a person to start in a particular career or particular job and to be there their whole life. Mm. They, they, despite whether or not they made the most that they could possibly make or they were given the, the, the 
uh, promotion that they expected, they stayed there mm. their whole whole life until they retired. And and now uh, through multiple generations since my dad's generation, the the attitude is if it's not good for me, I'm out. Mm. If you don't if you don't give me the opportunity, I'm out. If you don't pay me what I think I deserve, I'm out. Mm -hmm. And uh, you say, well, the commitment doesn't really matter mm -hmm. in, in the workplace. No, it does. Mm -hmm. It does. And where do you learn that commitment? Yeah. Except in the yeah. family. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. I'm even looking at even that example through the other lens, and that is the commitment of an employer. So you're looking at it, the employee, are they committed? And uh, if not, yeah. I'm going to go the other way. I'm thinking, well, how much is the employer committed to the employee? How much is the boss committed to the employee? And as a as a leader, what am I doing to represent to the people I lead that I'm committed to you? Yeah. And and I don't just see you as a tool to accomplish the work that I want to get done or that the organization or company wants to get done. I see you and value you as a person you are and I'm committed to you. And so it's interesting because I think as the generations have gone mm. to grandpa's generation, yeah. maybe even your generation, the boomer generation as a little bit have that example, mine and then the ones that have followed me is where it has gotten more of like, hey, I'm, I'm, I may stay with this, I may not, we'll see. The yep. idea of in one, being in one place for 30 or 40 years is really unheard of, you know, it feels like anymore. Yeah. Uh, but I wonder how much of that actually also had to do with employers. Yeah. How do the companies treat employees? Uh, and so learning what commitment looks like that it's not just about what serves me, but when I think about it in the context of leadership, my commitment is also about and should be what actually is best for the people. Yeah. So, okay, so commitment, we've talked about that. What's the next topic? Uh, relational uh, interaction. Mm. You, you learn in the family how to resolve conflict, mm. how, how to address issues that frustrate you. And so when you're little, you get frustrated, you hit your brother or your sister, <laughs> or you, you take things away from them that you want mm -hmm. that, you know. Yeah, you're, you're, you're responding and reacting to them and you're trying to get back at them. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so what you, what you learn or are supposed to learn in family is how to resolve conflict. Yeah. How, how to address issues. Yeah. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking actually about a situation between you and Tyler. Mm. Uh, that, I, I can't wait to hear what Tyler did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you... You came in one night, you were of driving age, you wanted to go over to a friend's house. Your friend had a younger brother, your younger brother's age. And so Tyler says, I want to go, I want to go. And you objected. No, I don't, I don't want him to go. I don't want him to hang out. But I said, no, you take your younger brother. So you you go, you're there for a couple hours or so. And when you come back into the house, Tyler's hair is wet and neatly cold. Mm. And it, you, you come in, hey, hey and I, I said, hey. And you're making your way to the kitchen to get a little bed snack before bed. And I said, whoa, 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 come here, guys. What, come, come back here. I said, Tyler, why is your hair wet? Oh, and I, it was nothing, nothing. I said, no, why, why was your hair wet? Why is your hair wet? And he said, well, um, I got a swirly. What's a swirly? And... A Don't pet. pretend that you didn't know what a swirly was. Come <laughs> on, you gave a few swirlies in your day. Okay, never mind. Go ahead. I, I'm, I might have. See, I didn't have a brother, so <laughs> oh, I, that's a good point. Yeah, you know. But uh, I said, "Whoa, come, what, what happened?" And uh, so you proceeded to say your your little brother was being a punk. Mm. He was, you know, uh, antagonizing the the other well, kids around. Yeah, your yeah. friends that were I remember there. this well. Yes, yes. Continue on. You, you can give your perspective here in a minute. Yeah, yeah. The first to present his case always sounds right until the second comes and challenges it. So Proverbs 18, 17 will be in play right now. Okay, well, I can just tell you. So I said, well, what do you mean? He was being a punk. And, and so he said, Dad, Tyler would say, Dad, it's okay. I'm, I'm fine. And I said, no, no. Now, what I was trying to train in, in the two of you is... We have a commitment to family. We have a commitment to relationship. If one's not acting right, you bring it to me and let me work it out. You don't take matters into your own hands or leave it to somebody else to do. Cool. So uh, I said, I said, Tyler, come here. And so he and I went back in the bedroom and I said, 
how'd you feel? Hmm. Well, he, he teared up a little bit and he said, well, it was embarrassing. Hmm. It was, there, there was a problem. And it, uh, as he's telling me this, there's just anger that's welling up. So what I said is you never let somebody else correct your, your family, your brother. We're committed to each other and you bring the issue to me and let me deal with the mm. injustice, with the punkiness, <laughs> what, whatever is taking place. The, the idea is that I'm teaching you how to respond. So now move that into the workplace. What do you deal with workplace conflict? Right. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with somebody in the workplace? I'm guessing that was swirlies. <laughs> no. Yeah. No I swirlies think, in the I workplace. I think HR would get notified about that. Yeah. No. <laughs> you, you, you learn the concept of how to resolve conflict, how to address issues, how to treat other people in the context of your family. Yeah. Yeah. So what what I, I love about that the appropriateness of what a parent brings in to to bring the proper correction. But if we think about family and anybody who has siblings, I know you didn't have a yep. brother, but you had two sisters. Yep, uh, I have a brother and two sisters. So, and and I have kids, and I know that lots of relational interactions take place without my presence, and they're they're doing their own um, self monitoring of. Uh, how they interact with each other. And obviously as kids grow, that's looking like fighting and conflict and so forth. And as they get older in life, maybe that still exists. I'm talking like late teens and whatever. But the thing that I think also happens in the context of it, minus a parent, is a little bit of self-regulation. Like in other words, um, you know, maybe the, an older sibling letting the letting younger sibling know, hey, we, that's not cool. Don't do that. And, and, and there is a almost a peer to peer accountability that begins to happen yep. that you begin to learn what's appropriate and not appropriate. And, you know, that's, and so I'm, I'm not saying all kids are, are good at doing that. So the, the parent involvement needs to happen. And I think you give a great example of what it looks like to go, Hey, let me set the principle for our family of what this looks like. But there's also the dynamic of, of how kids help to shape each other of, of what, works in in society and i guess I'm, I'm bringing that point to simply say the what is happening in the development of all of us is maturing and maturity yep. and i think a lot of times what you see in the workplace is people who really never matured yeah uh and and so they they <clears throat> they've grown physically they're adults and all that way but in their mind mentally uh how they react to the temper their temper tantrums just look bigger and and, and bolder now as adults, but they never learn how to regulate that. And actually in the context of family, sometimes even through conflict as children, you learn how to regulate that because of the dynamics that take place with family. So I guess my point a little bit for parents is, yes, you've got to be involved, but don't overly uh, try to interfere. Sometimes the working it out of the kids, I'm not suggesting fights and people are coming away bruised and that kind of stuff, but the conflict that exists is present in, in out of your uh, awareness, just like it will be when they're a, adults later in life and away from bosses. And so figuring out how that conflict works, some sometimes that includes compromise and negotiations and things that you have to do that's part of resolving conflict that siblings learn uh, when they're managing their own conflict. Yeah. One of, I, one of my sort of epic fails in this was I, later in life, you know, every parent finds out things that their kids did. They had no idea right. what we're going on. Well, uh, Lindsay, our youngest, uh, and so it goes you, then Lisa, then Tyler, then Lindsay. Well, Tyler and, and Lindsay were close together. And I, I find out, not because Lindsay's an adult that raised, but I find out that Tyler got frustrated with her talking or snoring or something like that and stuffed a pair of his underwear in her mouth. Now that's worse than a swirly. So whatever happened with his swirly thing, I, I hope, uh, yeah, I can't I wait to hear what you did this time. Oh, cause... if I had have known, there would have been a teaching moment. Uh, yeah, I guarantee yeah. and And a discipline moment uh -huh. that would have been a part of that. I didn't find out until they were both in or out of the house. And So this sort of seems like whatever he did to get the swirly seems a little bit more justified because it seems like Tyler had some real issues. Well, now in, in the case, it, it, you know, Tyler got the swirly, 
Lindsay got the underwear. Right, you know, I know. You know, yeah. and, and so the question is, well, what did she do to deserve the yeah. underwear amount? It doesn't matter. That's not how you deal with conflict. Yeah, that's true. You know, uh, hopefully, hopefully he's not still doing that today. No, and unfortunately, <laughs> they're they're uh, they're close. Yeah. They love each other. Yeah, uh, they were able to work through it uh, without my help. Yeah, but what I missed was the opportunity to to say, Lindsay, this is how you stand up for yourself mm. when uh, you've been treated wrongly. Yeah, when you you know because in it, in the context of the family, if you have more than one child, there's going to be conflict, and then they're going to tell on each other. Mm -hmm. They're going to try and get each other in trouble, and you teach them how to deal with the conflict and how to appropriately stand up for themselves in the peer relationship first, but uh, then when they can't work it out in the peer relationship, they bring it uh, to the peer. Yeah, one of the things I was thinking, if you're a parent looking to so ha say, how do I develop this in my home? How do I encourage the right kind of conflict resolution or this kind of social development in my kids, well, I think it would be to come in and, and maybe when a conflict arises, don't always go to discipline first or don't even go to you having to try to figure it out. Send the kids back into their own, you know, contained place where you're now you're aware of what's going on, but you go, hey, you guys figure it out and you come back and let me know how you resolved it. Where you didn't, the parent didn't have to get involved. The kids are learning how to, how to work this out and negotiate it. And they're not going to do it perfectly, so I'm not suggesting you just completely abdicate your parenting responsibility. But allowing that development, I guess it's still that's how that's how it can work yep. in, the, in the context of home. Yeah. So, talk about the uh, the next example. Well, first, let me just say: so you, you you monitor attitude, you monitor forgiveness in the process of that. You're teaching concepts that then uh, work in. So, if you're a business leader and you're having a problem with your em employees and they're constantly going to HR mm. to work out conflict issues, I, I'm just saying they they missed the opportunity of learning how to resolve these things yeah. when they were in their home. Now you have to teach this in the context of the workplace. It's probably a good point to, to interject also to just say, <laughs> I think uh, studies would show that what we're talking about, our family of origin and what that look like and the shaping of who we are is is so foundational in who we have become so yep so we're going through a process which we're really not talking about today but we do talk about in our cohorts uh in some of our teaching in our school we talk about the family of origin and what that looked like that's really shaped us today so if you haven't gone through that process i encourage you to to do that dive into that a little bit but go to go to the next uh, thing that you learn in family okay so uh, there's a concept that I think is a, an important part of this, and I, I call it the principle of transference. And uh, what I mean by that is you you can only transfer to somebody else what you live and model and have learned for yourself. So uh, the the old axiom or statement, don't do as I do, do as I say, never works to influence. And you learn that in the context of family. So as a mom or dad, you can't tell your kids not to lose their temper, not to use wrong words, to work hard or any of the concepts that you want them to carry on as adults if you don't live and model those concepts yourself. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. and so that's a, a critical piece of the development process, uh, the principle of transference. Yeah. Yeah, and and there's different ways that I've heard us talk about, you talk about, we talk about transference. And this one, you're talking about transferring from a parent to a child. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, if I'm learning as a parent how to moderate myself, and I didn't learn that, I didn't, my family of origin didn't teach me that well, or I, and I'm trying to adapt that and learn better so that I can transfer something different to my kids than what was transferred to me. What are, what are some ways that you think that sort of, if, there, if there's sort of a, a bridge or this baton between a, a, my experience, which may not have been great for my family of origin, I'm trying to change that now so my kids have a different, but what's programmed into me isn't necessarily uh, something that I'm great at modeling. But I know what I want, but it's hard for me to model it. How, how, how can somebody um, uh, work towards adapting to where they, they can model something that really wasn't modeled for them? Yeah. Be, be introspective first. 
uh, look at yourself and say, where am I missing the mark here? And maybe even ask the question, and why am I missing the mark? What did I miss in my development that I need to now learn myself? Oh. Uh, the the significance to me of, of um, for instance, uh, learning self-discipline, learning to say no. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you have no self-discipline, yeah. where, how do you develop self-discipline and model that first? Mm -hmm. You can talk to your kids, hey, don't eat so much. Mm -hmm. You're eating way too much candy or you're, you know, you're eating too much. You're, you're going to develop an unhealthy lifestyle. If you oh. eat too much and, right. you know, so you have to uh, internalize the issues and then learn to discipline yourself. Mm -hmm. Because here's the thing you have to remember, uh, more will be caught than is ever verbally taught. Mm. They're going to watch you. They're going to see how you respond. And they're going to look to to say, I remember my dad. My dad was a three-pack-a-day cigarette smoker. I had childhood asthma. And my, my dad said to me growing up, now, you know I smoke. Yeah, I do. <laughs> and he said, and you have asthma. And it's not going to be good for you to smoke. That never had any influence on whether or not I smoked or not. Mm. Because I thought to myself, though I never said it to my dad because he would have disciplined me mm. for talking back to him, but I thought to myself, well, if it's not good for me, why is it, why is it good for you? Right, yeah. why, why don't you stop smoking and give me an example rather than tell me not to smoke, but you're smoking three packs a day. Yeah. It yeah. didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking too. If I'm if I'm trying to learn something uh, that or teach my kids something that I really wasn't taught, um, it, I'm not saying this is the perfect way that it, <clears throat> that it happens. But being vulnerable with your children to say, "Hey, I'm I, I, here's what I want you to do. I'm still working through this in my own life. I'm still I wasn't really taught yeah. this. I'm trying to teach you something that I wasn't taught." because I've seen the effects of what I wasn't taught, how that's affected me, and it's been negative. What I wanna do is I wanna make something better for you, but I'm still learning myself. And, and to be able to say that, now again, you, you know, it's gotta be, a, a, the children have to be within the kind of age to understand that, which is probably younger than you know. <laughs> Usually we think, well, they gotta be older. I'm talking five, six-year-olds will yeah. understand this. They yep. understand vulnerability, they understand if you're being honest, and it will help them reconcile this thing of you're, telling me to do something, but you're doing something different. Well, if that really is a struggle and a propensity that I have, and I'm trying to change in my life, me being able to at least recognize it. Now I got to be showing that not only do I recognize it, but I'm trying to actively change it. Not that I'm living in it, but when I do that, it opens that door for my kids to be able to see, oh, okay, they're, well, they're being truthful with me and they're being honest. And I can hopefully learn from their own, um, exercise of change in their own life. Yeah. It, you know, simple things, but powerful examples. So uh, you want to teach your kids about authority, respecting authority, and you get pulled over for running a stop sign or for speeding. And as the cops coming up, you're going, ah, these, these stupid cops. They, well, they ought to be out catching the bad. Why are they? And you're emoting and your kids are watching yeah. and they're gaining a concept of authority that you're, you might say, well, I didn't teach them that. Yeah. I, I said, no, you, you need to be respectful. So when they get there, you roll down your window. Yes, sir. Officer. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You know, but they've already seen what you're doing right. as a uh, part of that process. It, you are teaching by what you're modeling that the concept that you want, or you come home, you're frustrated with your boss and you, you talk, Oh, it, it, you take out your frustration in front of the family, maybe at dinner or in a family conversation, and they learn, oh, it's okay to talk about your boss in a negative way and run your company down. It, it doesn't matter. And then you wonder right. why there's, there's issues that right. develop uh, in, in their concept of authority. They have this mindset that I don't trust any authority. Yeah. I don't have to do what you're telling me to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've, we've covered three. Yep. How many are there total? Oh, you know, I can keep going if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Uh, what's what's next? Uh, 
you you learn work ethic. You learn uh, hard work and the, the significance of keeping your word and doing the best that you can, whatever you do it. Now, I, I remember uh, when I was a preteen, uh, I thought one summer, I want to I want to mow yards. And so I went to my dad and I asked him, can I use our lawnmower and canvas the neighborhood and uh, and see if I can get some lawn mowing customers? My dad said, yeah, I think you're ready. You can do that. So I canvassed the neighborhood and I finally found my first customer. It was a widow lady that lived just, you know, a street over from us. And she said, yeah, you can mow my yard. Uh, and it was early in the week. I said, I need the yard mowed by Friday. Uh, and uh, I'm having guests come in for the weekend. And I said, yes, ma'am, I'll, I'll have it mowed for you. And she said, I want it done well. I want it edged, I want it swept. Yes, ma'am, I'll, I'll take care of that. And so I, I walked away really proud. I had my first customer. Well, the week went on and when Friday came, I hadn't mowed the yard. Uh, and when Friday came and uh, it was the last day, I had to have it mowed that day. Um, I, my friends were playing baseball down at the school and they said, hey, Lane, uh, come with us. We're, we're going to get a pick up baseball game. And I went, really? That appealed to me at that point more than oof, mow the yard. And, <laughs> Shocking. and so I blew it off and I went and played baseball. Mm. Promptly forgot about any, the, the commitment I made to the lady, the, you know, any work that I was uh, required to do. And so that night we're around the table at dinner and the phone rings and my mom answers the phone and all I hear is, what? Oh, really? He did. Oh, let me let you talk to Jim. That was my dad. So uh, my mom says, Jim, you, you need to talk to uh, Mrs. Sosa. And I'm eating, I'm, I'm clueless to what's going on. My dad gets on and he says, what? He did? You know, in this firm voice, he said, we'll be right there. He hangs up and he looks at me and he says, did you tell Mrs. So-and-so that you'd mow her yard by today? And I went, uh, um, well, I decided I don't want to do lawn mowing. He said, nope, <laughs> you don't get to choose that today. Yeah. You made a commitment. Your word will be your bond. Get your stuff. We're going to mow her yard. And I went, I'm still eating. He said, you can eat when we get back. We're mowing her yard. Her yard. So he walked with me. I'm pushing the lawnmower. He walked with me over to her house. He stood on the porch and watched as I mowed her yard. And he pointed, ah, 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 you missed the part right there. Just do that one again right there. And then he, he made sure that I edged and I swept. And uh, I mean, he was brutal. But what he was teaching me is when you give your word, you keep your word, you, you'll work hard and do the best you can. And then when I got all done mowing, he said to the lady, uh, she came out, we're, we're done. I want you to inspect. She inspected and says, thank you so much. Talking to my dad, it really helps. Mm. And, uh, and my, she, she said, let me pay him. My dad said, oh, no, no, no. This one's on us. What? I'm, I, I do all this work and I don't get paid? Yeah, you don't get paid because you didn't keep true yeah. uh, to your work. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I think that's great. I think what's interesting is, uh, you know, there was a, I think growing up for you, probably for me as well, thinking about work ethic, there was sort of this idea. You go, you get you get a paper out or you mow yards or, you know, there's like a series of things that you're just sort of expected to do as, yep. a, as a young teen and making money. Um, and that's really changed today of what that can look like. And so I think the trick for parents today is we have examples like that of what it looks like to build work ethic and what work ethic looks like. But in sort of today's economy, that work ethic looks a little differently. And, and so I knew I, I had to adapt to that. Now I've got three young adult children now, 23, 21, and, and 18. So I'm talking from the perspective of when they were growing, you know, in their young teen years of what that looked like to monitor work ethic. And I think that the point that I would say is I remember hearing um, John Maxwell talk about that his his dad incentivized him not to to go and I'm sure he had jobs and whatnot, but his as opposed to an allowance or whatever based on work he did around the home, he got paid based on books he read. And so what he was incentivized in work ethic is what he saw to be a value. 
I think so many times what parents do, they go work ethic looks like go mow yards and which it, it does do that. But some kids aren't wired that way. Yeah. And, and if you start looking at what's going to actually be a value later in life, all three of my kids, they didn't have the paper routes. They didn't have uh, the, the lawn mowing. But what they did have is they they worked in church, literally worked in church, and they learned how to communicate. And so what got trained in them was the value of communication, what it looks like to get up in front of people and lead a classroom of first graders. Yep. You can hold a first grader's attention. You can probably do pretty well communicating <laughs> across the board. And and I'm watching that in their lives now going, wow, that, that value really ended up being very purposeful for what it, their outcome is going to be. So my encouragement to you as, as parents when thinking about what happens in the context of family is what that work ethic might look like. And if you're maybe an old school thinker, maybe adapt a little bit to go, what, what really is valued today? And, and that might look different for what my kids are doing. Now, you may have a kid who's you're like, I just can't get them off the games. They're a gamer, blah, blah. There's quite a career in gaming. There's quite a career in what that can look like. So change your perspective a little bit to, to go, okay, so now how do we harness this into something that could look different in the future? It's just a completely different day in, in, in that way. Exactly. I think and turn it into concepts like uh, I don't feel like working today, mm. whatever that is. Don't feel like reading any books today. I don't feel like doing what yeah. my, my right. potential job might be. And what the concept you're training is, yeah, some days you're not going to feel like it. Right. And what you have to do is discipline yourself. You have to overcome that right. in order to keep your word to to work hard yep. to, and and uh, one one other sort of concept in this is um being associated with church or churches uh, i talk to parents who you say yeah i you know my i took my kids to church uh but uh, they got into their teens and they really their friends don't go and they don't want to go and it, you know and i don't I don't want to frustrate them and make them so I don't, I don't make them and they end up not going. Then they go off to college and they sort of sow their wild oats and they, they don't end up with their heart in church. What, what we tried to do with you kids is we said, here's, here's what we believe as a family. We're going to, our commitment is to Jesus, to live for him and to incorporate him into the circumstances of our life. And here's what that involves. We're going to find a local congregation of believers, Bible-based, you know, evangelical believers. We're going to we're going to step into that. Uh, we're going to find in, in the context of that community a smaller group that we can build friendships uh, around. And uh, and we're going to involve ourselves, and we're going to expect you to be involved. And so you can go to youth church. Uh, you you can you can build uh, a group of friends. Well, at some point, every one of you kids uh, got to the place of saying, "Yeah, I don't want to go tonight. I don't feel like going. To, I got too much homework. I got uh, this." And uh, I was pretty firm. Your mom brought some balance uh, to me in this, but I was firm to say, "Nope." You know, it, and and if the excuse was, "Yeah, it's still fun." No, nobody's going. It's, you know, I don't, why do I have to go? None of my friends go. And I said, I would say, well, look, I'll go with you to meet with the youth pastor. And we're going to talk to him about what, what he could possibly change to make it fun and attract you and your friends. Well, none of you wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. And so then I'd say, well, then I suggest that you get on the phone and we'll call your friends and say, hey, come with me tonight. You'll, you'll find somebody, you'll find two or three people you begin to be the influence rather than being influenced. And I believe that because we did that, we created within you a an appetite for God, for his bride, the church, for the community of uh, relationship with other believers that you still activate today as adults. Mm -hmm. it's, in, it's important that yeah, do that. And this we we're saying that in the context of, of still the topic of work ethic. And right. I think what I would say in summary is the idea of work ethic and what we're establishing within a home is less about the topic of what the work is, and it's more about the ethics of working. Okay, we're winding towards the end. We got a couple more. What's the next topic? Yeah. So the next one is stewardship. Uh, stewardship is the idea 
that the things that I have or been, have been entrusted with that I'm going to take care of. Mm. And uh, it begins when, when you're young to say, uh, don't throw your toys. Don't, don't step on them. It, it, yeah, well, I don't like that anymore. Well, I don't want that anymore. Well, I don't care about that anymore. Now, it, we're going to do our best to take care of what we have. And, and it's based on the belief that everything that we have has been given to us, whether we acknowledge it or realize it or not, from God. It all belongs to him. The Psalm 24, 1 says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And so um, we want to be good stewards of what we've been entrusted with. And part of that is uh, we show how to take care of it. Mm. Well, I model that. So I'm, I keep my cars clean. I keep them vacuumed. We take care of our house. We up upkeep, you know, make sure that it, it doesn't fall in disrepair. Mm. Why? Because the 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 idea is stewardship. So carry that into the marketplace and in, into the, the work that you do. And it's like whatever I'm given, the every, whatever responsibility I've, I'm given, I'm going to do my best to take care of it, and I will return it to you in better shape than what I got it because I want to be a good steward. Yeah. And when we're good stewards, what we know biblically is God God looks for those who know how to steward what they've been given so he can entrust them with more. Exactly. And assuming we're in the in the the point of this is leadership development, how do we grow and develop? Then proving ourselves as as a good steward is essentially what what we want in order to be be able to be given more. Um yeah, I think about the the idea of what it looks like for me to take care of things, for me to value things and manage things. And that's not always uh, what people are naturally gifted at, even as they continue to get older. I remember I was talking to a, a very respected counselor and I was talking about my son. Uh, and at the time my son was, he struggled to steward his room <laughs> and what that looks like. It was a mess all the time. Uh, and, and the mess would overflow out of his room into sort of the den area that was outside of his room and da da da. And I was talking to this, this counselor and he said, so, so what's the problem with that? And I went, well, He's clearly got a problem keeping stuff clean. He said, so what, what's it to you? I'm like, well, I'm trying to teach a value of cleanliness and stewardship, blah, blah. He goes, well, um, why don't you give him his own space and let it be whatever is going to be in that space? He said, Where, what I would suggest to you is the boundary is once it starts to overflow out of his room, then, then great, that's not acceptable. But in his room, let it be as messy as, as he wants. I'm like, th- you're, you're suggesting that's good counsel for how do I teach stewardship? He said, well, you can continue to teach and and give the values, but then give him the responsibility within his domain. And I was like, man, listen, I'm, I was raised by you. It was like, they, <laughs> my domain is the entire house. <laughs> and he was like, no, give him his area. And then that's, he didn't say these words, but that's how he'll, he'll learn to steward is what he's given domain and dominion of. And uh, so I, I applied that. And it was hard because uh, just basic things, you know, I'm like, again, I, I was trained by you. So I'm like, I want the bed made. I want the clothes picked up. I wanted it. And that just wasn't how he was wired. And, and so it was kind of a mess. Well, he goes to college. First time he kind of gets his own sort of, you know, well, he's, yes. And, and away from us and that kind of deal. So he comes home the following summer and, uh, well, I'd, I'd go to his room every once in a while, every day, bed made, room clean. And I mean, Blend and I were like, who is this kid? <laughs> and we would talk about it. He was like, I, you know, I got to school. I just kind of learned what, what, I, what I really liked. And so I think what I realized in that, my encouragement to some parent who might be in the place I was at that time, I'll give you the same advice that the counselor gave me, which is teach the principles, teach the values that are important, but then give them their domain and, and trust that the process you train the child in the way that he or she should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. It doesn't mean that in the moment they're catching the training. It doesn't mean in that very moment you're going to see every fruit of what you're being tra- what you're training into them. But in due time, you'll see that. And I, having experienced that, uh, I, yeah. the, it was this balance of the teaching the stewardship principle. And part of the stewardship principle was you have things you're responsible for. What you do with that, that's going to be, it's going to be a reflection on you. And that did bear fruit in a positive way over time. Yeah. Yeah. Even uh, as a parent, uh, when they come to you and say, 
I need, I need more. I want more. I, you know, I, I have this car and it's kind of old and dilapidated and I haven't taken care of it. Uh, I haven't washed it and vacuumed it, but I need a new car. Well, when I get a new car, I'll, I'll think, really take care of it. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll really. <laughs> and it's not true. Yeah. Faithful in little, faithful in much. Yeah. One of the things in stewardship that we we talk about, but a lot of a lot of times it's what people think, and that has to do with money, how I manage money. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in the '70s, I read a Reader's Digest article, and the article uh, said that. They, they had done research, a study, and found that people who made less than $25,000 a year, uh, the, they, uh, they struggled uh, to make ends meet, to pay all their bills. And, 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 and what they found in the study was, and people who made more than 25000 struggled to make their, as you as your income scaled, if you didn't know how to manage it at twenty-five thousand, when it was fifty or seventy-five or a hundred or two hundred, you still struggled. You mm -hmm. overspent. You didn't manage, and so the the whole idea is: I'm learning to take care of what I have, what I've been given, yep. to manage it well, and as I do, it qualifies me for more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's hit the, the final topic. What's the last okay. one of how we learn in the context of family? Uh, the, it's values or morality. Hmm. It's, it's the, the, the structure for determining right or wrong mm -hmm. in, in the way that we live life. And so um, if the goal is not to motivate by guilt, by uh, you know, telling our kids when they don't, Per, that we love them based on their performance, and then when they don't perform, you know, shame on you. Mm. That that's not that's not what we're talking about. Right. But it is to say we have certain values, and and yep. I attempt to live my life on those values, and I'll declare them to you. I'll tell you what my values are, so that you can keep me accountable. Mm -hmm. If if I'm acting in a certain way. And you don't understand why are you doing that, Dad? I thought you believed so and so and so and so. Mm. You, you can call me out on it. And and when you get old enough, I'm I'm going to say to you, okay, these are the values that I've tried to live my life by, and I lived before you. Do you want those values to be yours? And if you tell me yes, well then, if I see you acting in a way that's inconsistent, I'm going to ask you. Yeah. Help, help me understand that. Yeah, because there is a generational disconnect. Yeah, and what we want is values m more than we want actions, certain yeah. actions. Well, and what what uh, becomes key in that is accountability. Mm -hmm. Because I think about how to apply this in the workplace, and I go, you know, what happens? Uh, most organizations, so if somebody goes to work someplace, they they've probably worked to identify their values and their mission statement, blah blah blah. Uh, and that's worked itself into some operational procedures and organizational policies yep. and blah, blah, blah. Well, if, if I grew up in a place that one, we didn't even talk about that stuff, or if we did talk about it, but never held accountability to it, then when I get into the workplace, I don't care about corporate policies. It just, it becomes a framed whatever. Hey, great. You got it. You put it on the walls, but whatever, because nobody really lives by it or uh, we're not accountable to it. So, so training that into... Uh, a young person or in the context of family, it's one thing to define it, which is key. It's another thing then once you define it to actually then live by it. Yeah. Then once you live by it, it's a matter of holding other people in your family accountable to it. So yep. definition, living by it, and then accountability. And that's part of the preparation that sets someone up well to step into a, 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 work, a workforce that says, hey, there's a way that we do things and you can contribute to that by how you live out you know this uh, this action for the for the organization. And one of the things that you've done so well as you've raised your kids in this is you've made it age appropriate. Mm. You know you don't you don't talk over their head about values that they wouldn't they wouldn't get. Yeah. But you you developed it over time uh, to impart, and that's so key as well. Well, and, and maybe to kind of wrap up this topic, we've talked about almost in the context of like, okay, parenting and even young 
people. But I guess the encouragement would be, uh, even as families get get older and, and grow, and here we are in multiple generations of, of our family, three and four generations, what is still built within the context of, of family is huge. And so, again, if you're today looking at your family and you're going, it's 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 just me. I don't I don't even have a spouse yet, or I have a spouse. We don't have any kids yet. So all of this topic, I just want to cast a bigger vision for you to say, as you begin to build out your family, you're not setting up just what the success looks like for your home. You're setting yourself and your family up for success for the future. And down the road, multiple generations later, this is still happening. You at at the stage of life you're in, you're still influencing me in all the ways we just talked about. <laughs> and you're influencing my kids, your grandkids, and other, you know, even, even nephews and nieces, it's all happening yeah. because of the context of family. So do the, do the hard effort today to build that culture in your home, see the future for what you can develop in your family. It's worth it and it will bear good fruit. So dad, why don't you, uh, why don't you pray us out uh, yeah. on this topic? And, yeah, I'd love and to we'll go. Just remember leadership is more than just, uh, the marketplace. Yeah. It, it begins in your home and that's what we're talking about today. Lord, thank you for our friends. Uh, thank you, Lord. We just ask you to make an impartation today on what true leadership is all about. We, we declare uh, today that we, we want to gain the, the right things. Your word says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his life? Life is uh, wrapped up in the values that we carry and the families that we connect with. Lord, help us to do that today. Pray your blessing uh, over this content and over the people watching. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll see you next time.